We're going to pick up where we left off and uh, evaluate the residual anomaly that we extracted the other day. First, we'll just kind of quickly review the uh, graphical separation uh, approach uh, to extracting the residual. We'll talk uh, briefly about non-uniqueness and uh, th then we'll uh, interpret the residual that we uh, that we extracted. So remember the graphical separation of the residual starts by assuming that you know there there was no anomaly and you, you're just continuing the uh, regional field through the area as if uh, there was no perturbation or disturbance uh, associated with a, a, a shallower uh, localized um, object. So uh, this would be our regional field and we would just see a, kind of a stair ladder of lines going through the area. And we just indicated that, that we can separate the residual from the regional by taking this um, set of regional lines and then looking at the relative value of the contoured uh, uh, total anomaly uh, relative to the what we're assuming to be kind of the background or the underlying regional field. So, you know, in this case we've got um, 17, minus 17.5 17 contour line, regional contour line that goes through the area. Uh, minus 18 is minus 0 0.5 relative to 17.5. Minus 18.5 is minus 0 0.5 relative to 18. So on. So we just label all the intersection points and then we contour it. So this is a pretty crude, uh, pretty crude hand contoured um, <clears throat> image of, of, of the result that you might obtain if you do that. And you can see where the regional lines have just been extended through the area and we've just looked at the uh, relative value of the um, uh, actual anomaly uh, relative to the uh, regional field which cuts through the area. So we've got a circular anomaly. Uh, we could start using some of our simple geometrical objects. Well we've only looked at one so far, that, that's the sphere. We'll get into a, a few others later, but circular in shape, if it's a sphere, what's its depth? Um, if we know something about the density contrast, what's its radius? Uh, uh, alternatively, if we know, have some idea of what the radius of these objects are likely to be, we could estimate the uh, delta rho. <clears throat> So we talked about uh, if you look through some of the slides on terrain conductivity, we talked about equivalent solutions, and equivalent solutions are are acceptable uh, answers to a problem, which give you pretty much the same answer with, within you know a certain amount of allowable error. Uh, Non-uniqueness solutions are perhaps a little bit different in the sense that here we have um, you know our sphere. Uh, producing this anomaly. <clears throat> we could estimate the depth of the sphere by looking at the half max point and multiplying that by 1.305. But we could also produce the same anomaly with a lens shaped object at a lesser depth and by an even more lenticular object at, at a very shallow depth, a, a thinner lenticular object. So producing the same anomaly. And one of the things to take away from, and you see the lines that Nettleton, this comes from a monograph by Nettleton, a very good monograph, is to see where these lines converge. You know, we, we have acceptable solutions anywhere, you know, from something very extensive at, right at the surface to something very compact. And this sphere, the center of the sphere represents the maximum depth you can't have something down here producing this anomaly because if it were down here, think about it, 1.305 times z, well, the breadth of that anomaly would be larger. So that's, that's something to consider as you're looking at some of these simple geometrical objects. We're presenting them in relatively compact form, you know, as was the case for the sphere. Think of it as a point. This would be the maximum depth that... Uh, 
you could have an object which would produce this anomaly. So um, longer wavelengths, uh, deeper, deeper sources, and uh, shorter wavelengths, uh, shallower sources, and there's this idea of a maximum maximum depth, uh, depending on you know this kind of the most compact configuration of the object that you you are using to represent uh, that anomaly. <clears throat> but anomalies are certainly non-unique, and here. Uh, all we're doing is we're just taking a profile. Uh, let me see if I can slip back here. We we're just looking at this profile A A prime and uh, have uh, digitized points along that profile. So this would be the uh, total field, including the anomaly. But we want to look at the anomaly. So what we're doing here is we're just you know we have the data in Excel. We fit a trend line here and we get an equation for it. So this trend line uh, gives us an estimation of what the regional field is in the area and uh, we can subtract that from the total in order to get the residual. So this trend line we can think of as the regional field. It's just an Excel trend line. You get a formula and we get a pretty good fit. You know, you, you, The fit will vary depending upon how irregular the residual features are. So it's neither good nor bad. Maybe your assumption that it's linear would would come into question. But that assumption would usually be based on your understanding of the local geology. What's the underlying geology look like? Is it uh, kind of a linearly dipping sequence of uh, lower to higher density rocks, then you know, we should honor a, a linear inter If it has structure in it, then you know perhaps a polynomial. But we've um, taken the um, trend line equation here, this uh, regression line. We subtracted it from the total. We get this regional. And I've also shifted the uh, regional so that it's um, uh, entirely in the negative. And, uh, that makes the analysis a little bit easier for us. And there's really no reason why um, we need to think of this anomaly as being partly positive and partly uh, negative. Most likely it's either a negative or a positive density contrast, in this case a negative density contrast with respect to, to the surrounding area. And you see the regional now, or the residual, is is nearly symmetrical in shape. So uh, we have something that we can uh, apply our um, uh, simple geometrical objects. We've, you know, again, we've only looked at the sphere, so we could think of this as a uh, uh, spherically shaped object, which is producing this anomaly. And, and you know, and just think of the things that you could do. Uh, kind of kind of refresh your memory uh, about the analysis that we undertook before of spherically symmetric objects. Uh, first of all, you might notice that the minimum, in this case we're kind of doing things relative to the minimum, it's located at about 54, 50 meters along the profile. And the minimum value is minus 2.1 milligal. So G1 half is going to be located at approximately minus 1 0.05 milligauss, probably right about there, and <clears throat> that would be at um, uh, around 3,700 milligauss along the profile, or 7,000 meters along the profile. So you could use both of them at uh, 3,500 and 3,700, uh, 3,700 and 7,000 and take an average. You know, We don't really have any too much noise here, but we have a little bit. And, uh, and so if we make the uh, estimates of the depth to the anomaly, um, we, we have to be careful to use the distance from the minimum in this case, which is 1,750 meters to the left, and so x1 half then is um, uh, approximately 1,750 meters, and it works out that way to the right as well. 
or excuse me, it, we get about 15, 15 meters to the right. And um, so we'd, we'd be using a, 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 an average value of the two x1 halves in order to uh, estimate the depth. So we have these two values of x1 half. Uh, so we'll just put some geological background into this. Let's assume that um, this is a salt pillow or a salt uh, pillar and it may be a prospective exploration uh, target. The asymmetry uh, may be due to some irregularities in the, in the pillow or the uh, pillar or the diapir. And <clears throat> we want to estimate the depth to the center of the, of the diapir, let's say, or the pillow. And um, so you might take a moment to just kind of recall how we do that. You know, we use the uh, depth index multiplier, which in the case of x1 half, uh, you might look through your notes. And the depth index multiplier for the x1 half position is 1.305 times our average. This would be the average x1 half of 1650. That gives us a depth to the center of this um, of this object of about uh, 2,153 meters. So hopefully that was fairly easy to do. Uh, the density of the salt is you know, generally somewhere between 2, 2 and 2.2 grams per cubic centimeter. Uh, really, you know, the kind of anomaly that's going to be produced really depends on the delta rho and the uh, difference between the density of the salt and the surrounding um, surrounding strata, but it it has a relatively low density, so it tends to be buoyant. It's it's a, um, a you know fair, fairly ductile material that flows over, over geological time scales, and so we'll approximate this uh, diapir uh, using a sphere. You know, maybe, maybe it looks something like this. This might be something that we're after more so than maybe the pillow. And let's estimate its radius. So we'll assume a, a density of 2.1, and we'll try to estimate its radius. And we need to have some additional information, like what's the density of the surrounding material. So uh, we'll assume a 2.5 gram per cubic centimeter average density for the material surrounding the, den the, uh, the diapir, and 2.1 grams per cubic centimeter for the salt. That gives us a delta rho of 0.4 grams per cubic centimeter. And when we uh, did our x1 half, half max uh, analysis, we got a depth of 2153 meters to the center of the diapir. And we measured off a value of uh, 2.1 milligauss is actually a minimum. This should be a minus sign here. And then we plug all that in. We could uh, use negative signs for the value of g and delta rho. Uh, you know, in this case, either way, they cancel out. And we plug it into this formula. This constant, remember, gives us a result in uh, meters uh, with inputs of density in grams per cubic centimeter. And so in the end, we get a radius of 955 meters. So this is a fairly large um, salt diapir, which is piercing its way up through the uh, sedimentary cover. And... Um, so we've gotten the depth, we've got an, a, an idea of the size. We could have also turned this around and uh, solved for the density contrast, if we had some idea about the size. Usually you know a lot, enough about the geology so you know you can make a reasonable um, assumption. Uh, you know, which, which parameter is most, do you have the most information about? Uh, yeah. Either way you're often making a guess, but you know that that can either confirm or or rule out, rule out certain interpretations that you have in mind. So we've talked about the anomaly produced by a sphere in rather great detail. Uh, we'll, we'll take a look at a couple additional anomalies, and uh, we're going to take a look at the horizontal cylinder. And this would just be looking uh, normal to the axis, so we can see the cylinder running left to right. This view is a view looking down the axis of the cylinder so it looks like uh, just a circ circular cross-section. And the anomaly that we would 
<clears throat> so, you know, if we were just at the surface running along the surface along the length of the cylinder, the acceleration due to gravity, the anomaly, would be constant. But if we go cr across the cylinder, normal to the cylinder, we're going to see an anomaly that looks a lot like that of the sphere. This is the form of that anomaly. And we'll come back next time and talk in a little bit more detail about uh, uh, the anomaly associated with a horizontal cylinder. Join us next time.